Uh, good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to our PLUS uh, webinar series. Today we are going to be discussing about the Zimbabwe crisis. A lot has been happening in Zimbabwe, especially in the past uh, two months. And there's been a lot of intellectual debate in terms of what's really happening there uh, in Zimbabwe. So today, I've got with me here Justina Mukoko. She's a human rights activist, a woman of courage. She's actually on the ground in Harare. She has also written a book about her abductions and trials and the struggle for human rights in Zimbabwe, which is a must read. Then I have Dr. Twende Pishone, who is a radical political economist uh, from the Tabombeki Institute. He has also written a book trying to understand uh, the Zimbabwean issues uh, using the political economy uh, lens. Uh, his book is on the reconfiguration of agrarian relations in Zimbabwe. Then thirdly, I have Professor Brian Raftopoulos. He is one of the leading uh, public intellectuals on Zimbabwe politics. Currently is a research fellow um, with the University of Free State, working with the International Studies Group. So today, we are trying to look at, to unpack the crisis in Zimbabwe. There is one narrative which is being sponsored by the ruling party, uh, ZANU-PF, uh, the government and its uh, defenders, that what is happening in Zimbabwe at the moment it's a post-colonial redistributive project, uh, which is radical in nature and which is necessary in order to address uh, colonial problems, in order to address uh, the neo-imperial problems in the world that the government is actually trying to ward off uh, sanctions that uh, were imposed by, by the Western powers. Actually, the government has recently said that uh, there is no crisis in Zimbabwe. What is there uh, are, are difficulties that any nation faces, uh, difficulties to deal with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, drought and climate change. These are the issues that they have been advancing. But we have seen a lot from the media uh, recently, uh, lots of human rights violations uh, that have happened in that country and also, there seems to be a breakdown of the rule of law, no respect for the constitution and civil liberties. And we really want to understand today what is the nature of this crisis, how has it been manifesting, and what can be done. So I'll start here with Justina Mukoko, who will be speaking from Harare in Zimbabwe. What exactly is happening? in Zimbabwe, Justina, is there a crisis or not? Thank you very much, uh, Pilani. Um, from where I'm sitting, I think I will argue to say that there is a crisis. Um, you might be aware that uh, yesterday the government responded to the pastoral letter of the uh, Catholic bishops. And uh, if you look at the response, it's uh, 22 pages, if I'm not mistaken. And for me, that's um, an indication that we do have a crisis in the country. And the crisis is at various levels. But I think in my um, speech today, I'm going to be speaking mainly in relation to the human rights um, crisis. Um, although the constitution, uh, the 2013 constitution, which we all have said is a progressive document, um, does guarantee human rights um, in chapter four, what we have noted really is um, a lot to be desired. Um, and I will begin by saying that we have seen killings happening 
and um, no one really has uh, taken responsibility or has uh, been made to account. August 1, 2018, six civilians were gunned down in the streets of Barar. We had the Mothlante Commission coming into the country. They had testimonies. They did a report that was presented to the president. They had recommendations there. And uh, amongst those recommendations, they wanted those who did this to account for their actions. But I can tell you that up to today, no one has accounted. As if that was not enough, when the report came out, even before the, the ink on it had dried, January 2019, 17 more people were killed um, by the security forces. And then as we are in lockdown and, and um, um, having to uh, deal with enforcing the COVID-19 um, regulations, there are more killings that have taken place. A young man, Paul Munakopa from Bulawayo, um, was killed um, by uh, a member of the police. Uh, Levison Ngobe, who was beaten up by the police and um, later died as a result of the injuries that he sustained, um, he was also beaten up by the police um, and obviously we will conclude that they are the ones who caused his um, his death we have also seen the um that um, young tamangani a, a vendor died in police custody and uh, i think it's in wulilima ward 2 where mazwin love was attacked by some ZANU PF members after he voiced concern about the inability of people from the opposition to access um, food and other aid that was being distributed. We have seen arbitrary arrests um, and the limiting of rights of detained individuals. We saw seven. Um, there were about three women and four men uh, who have now been called the Maldives Seven were arrested in May 2019 on charges of subversion. And uh, those charges were only dropped a week ago. We have seen MDC supporters being hunted down, uh, especially when there was an intention to protest which protests were then crushed using prohibition orders. We have also seen a huge number of abductions, uh, torture, and in some instances, sexual assault for those who um, have become, who are victims of abductions. Um, among those, we uh, see the likes of Tatenda Mombeyarara, and then the three, young MDC um, women leaders, um, Honorable Joanna Mamombe, Cecilia Chimbiri, and Netai Marova. We also saw the abduction of Samantha Kurea, who is um, a comedian. And uh, I think recently, around the July 31, we saw the abduction of Tawanda Mchehiwa, who is a nephew to Mdudu Zimatutu. Uh, Matutu is now in um, in hiding, um, and uh, we also saw the abduction and torture, and also sexual assault of Nokolo Maposa. And I think even today, if you were to ask any Zimbabwean um, what they are really afraid of, they will tell you that one of the things that they are really afraid of is being abducted because they could be subjected to any form of abuse 
without any limitation on the part of the abductors. We have also seen arrests and also assaults of those people who have been said to have been arrested. Among those, we saw Nokutu, this, the, the Mpofu sisters, Nokutula and Tombizodwa, who were um, gravely assaulted by the police. This is a case that is before the courts. We have also seen the arrest of Namatai and Wongai, who were protesting the um, constitutional amendment number two uh, public hearings that were um, taking place during the COVID-19 period with all the regulations around it. And their uh, protest was that there was not going to be enough um, consultation with limited numbers of people. And we have also seen the arrest, I think it's a month now, since Hopo Chingono and Jacob Garivome were arrested. And we are also aware of the arrest of Godfrey uh, Kurawone and MDC activists um, in Mashingo. And we have many others who have faced um, um, arrest. We have also seen the limiting of freedom of expression and um, the freedom to work as journalists. And this is a bit of a worry to um, a lot of us. And the right to a fair trial, which should entail access to legal representation of choice. We have seen what has happened in Hopol Chingono's case, where uh, Mrs. Beatrice Mtetwa has been barred from representing, um, from rep from representing um, Hopwell. And I think for us in civil society, we are also worried in terms of the threats that continue to um, come to us. Um, uh, there have been um, statements like flushing out rotten apples and, um, and dark forces. And we are not sure who those dark forces are. But I think what we are also recognizing is that there's been a lot of limiting the space in which we operate. And then when we look at the, um, the global pandemic, COVID-19, we are also recognizing that um, there are so many human rights abuses that are happening in the name of enforcing um, the regulations. We have had so many people who have been arrested. We have had a lot of people who have been subjected to bribery and corruption where security forces ask people to give them money um, in exchange for their freedom so that they do not go to a police station where they are supposed to, to pay a fine. And uh, all those situations are situations that are um, making it difficult for us to even think that Zimbabweans are enjoying um, their rights. You find that if you pass a, a checkpoint, you will find a lot of people who are, who are actually dehumanized by the way that they are being treated by um, the security forces at, um, at checkpoints. And um, this just points to the fact that I think because no one really follows up to look at what is happening, no one really worries if the rights of people are actually being, um, being violated. And I, th I think I would also just want to quickly look at the health sector. It did not come with COVID-19. I think COVID-19 actually just exposed further the, the, the deterioration of our health delivery system, where we saw a few weeks ago that out of um, eight women who went to give birth, only one was able to go home with their baby. The others um, actually had... Um, had stillborns. And it's something that we would not have dreamt happening in Zimbabwe in the year 2020. And the challenge that is being faced there is that for a, a long period of time, health workers have been on strike um, because their concerns are not being um, listened to. And as a result, a lot of them are just pulling back their services 
because even as we are facing COVID-19, they do not have adequate PPEs for them to be able to do their work, um, to do their work properly. And then I think it was the health ministry as well that was that went into uh, a big challenge in terms of corruption. We know that the minister was eventually fired on um, allegations of being involved in corrupt um, practices. I think I will leave it there. I think um, um, my time is um, is up. Oh, thank you very much, um, Justina. Uh, you paint a very depressing picture. It seems there is a very authoritarian project that is ongoing in Zimbabwe, a state uh, that has turned on its own citizens, perhaps in the words of uh, uh, Lloyd uh, Sachikonye. Uh, let us now try to hear from uh, Dr. Toyende Pishoni, how do you view this crisis as a radical political economist? Thank you, uh, Dr. Zamchia. Um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I think the question that we have to grapple with is how did we get here um, having attained our independence in 1980 uh, and today we seem to struggle with the things that bothered us before then i think in 1980 the socialist approach of kutaru jinji was intended to ensure that the disenfranchised African population that uh, were being excluded from the minority white economy before 1980 could be brought back into the economy and could benefit and also accumulate. But uh, what we saw in, in the 1990s when ISAP was introduced was that uh, the government see participation in key sectors was reduced which then led to the uh, uh, increased unemployment and a lot of uh, uh, crises is arising out of that process when this Guta Jinji was revisited in the period uh, of 2000, uh, and some say when the government or the ruling party was under pressure from um, uh, the formation of the MDC and, and so forth, the uh, government then resorted to the land reform, which was intended again also to ensure a broad based accumulation uh, model. Uh, of course, the program was able to give land to more than now 300,000 uh, households. Um, and these households are supposed to now to participate in, in, in uh, agriculture and to ensure uh, food security uh, for the country, but also to accumulate um, and move upwards in, in, in terms of um, social standing. Uh, and the reduction or elimination of, of poverty. Uh, but what we have seen, unfortunately, is, is that there has been an extractive uh, uh, kind of um, approach to the way that uh, resources have been extracted uh, in the mining sector and also in agriculture. So in the key sectors that are supposed to ensure that uh, the economy uh, allows citizens to uh, do better. Uh, in the mining sector, we have seen how diamonds have disappeared. We have seen how gold uh, is trading has become very opaque and less transparent. In agriculture, we have also seen, for instance, how the prices for
for tobacco, which has become the mainstay for a lot of rural uh, and A1 farmers. Uh, the prices are depressed and the farmers are paid uh, in the local currency 50% of the price. The balance is also in the US dollar, but they can't access it. They have to, they are being forced to, in fact, buy this and that uh, by the authorities. Uh, and the money is, in fact, confiscated by the Reserve Bank. Um, so the farmers and the miners who are supposed to benefit from these key sectors uh, are not benefiting. Uh, what we see, unfortunately, is the increased participation of the military, a military-led accumulation model that can be traced from the DRC wars to the Makuta programs of 2005, uh, where they become very central to the manner in which people can access resources um, and, in fact, also control uh, the politics of the day uh, by so doing. Um, uh, and we have also seen that the military now has yes, become ubiquitous. They are in almost every sector uh, and running uh, processes. Uh, which explains why in 2008, when the MDC won the elections, they, they through joke, some of these securocrats were able to uh, 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 stop um, the transition that it become uh, obvious. And uh, of course, in 2017, we then saw how they were able to effect changes to ensure that they protect their, uh, what I could call, um, uh, loot. So we, we, we also see that uh, part of it is also now, in fact, the military-led accumulation model is supported or complemented by state capture, where corruption is coordinated from the very, very elite at the very top, where uh, uh, companies like uh, Sakunda lead uh, the processes. And of course, there are accusations that these companies are linked to the first family. Um, and we have seen, of course, that through these uh, companies, uh, some, some, uh, have asserted that uh, they now control programs such as command agriculture, which are supposed to benefit uh, farmers and the agricultural sector, but uh, have now become focused on very few. So there is a lot of talk of corruption, but this corruption is now narrowed to the A2 farmers mostly, which is the middle scale farmers that. Uh, and less than 20% of those even, which is about 30,000 uh, 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 farmers, 20% of those are the ones that are benefiting from those processes, including the mechanization programs that we have seen being spoken about in a few months. We have also seen this even in maize, where in years of uh, shortages, very few people who are connected also to the ruling part and the elites uh, are given the foreign currency through the reserve bank uh, and uh, coordinate this through the grain uh, millers association uh, so there is a narrowing of uh, the accumulation uh, to a very few and the majority of the population are then excluded and left in a precarious inform, in, informal sector where uh, it is not certain when the next meal okay, can be and they live uh, hand to mouth. Um, and under those circumstances now, there is a disconnect between the citizen and their government because they is no, there are no opportunities for citizens to earn a decent living and therefore there is 
a, a, a rising, a political challenge, because those that are accumulating protect a power and they focus on power retention so that they protect their economic interests and they use brutality, they coerce populations, they, they do everything to ensure that they are able to protect that which they have uh, accumulated. Um, and this develops what uh, others have called a breakdown of the social contract, contract, where there is basically mistrust between the government and the population. Uh, I will leave it there uh, for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Toyendepe, uh, for unpacking what's happening in the economic sector and how it's worsening the crisis in Zimbabwe. You were definitely talking about a livelihoods crisis there, but there's also patronage in terms of uh, capture of state resources uh, by the upper classes and the militarization of the economic uh, sector. So let's now uh, move uh, to Professor uh, Brian Raftoplas. Professor Brian Raftoplas, Justina has made an emphasis on what's going on in Zimbabwe in terms of uh, massive human rights uh, uh, violations. And uh, Toyendep is also saying, but what we have here is actually a deeper, more structural problem that has to deal with the accumulation uh, problems in the post-colonial state. Uh, what's your input on the subject today, Prof? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zamchia, and thank you to Justina and Joined Epi for very clear graphic uh, presentations. I think what we're seeing now in Zimbabwe is uh, the declining legacy of a particular liberation movement, which has lessons for other liberation movements in Zimbabwe. We see a party of the liberation which is in increasingly relying on repression rather than the consensual participation of its citizenry. And this started during the period of the Mugabe uh, regime and has only deepened under the Mnangagwa uh, uh, rule in the post-coup 2017 period. And what it speaks to, I think, is the way that also the, the discourses of human rights and radical distribution have been dichotomized in the Zimbabwean dis, in the Zimbabwe narrative. Zanu PF very early on in the in the 2000s uh, built tried to build a wall between what it considered its la radical land redistribution program, which was tied to a certain construction of Pan Africanism and anti imperialism, and on the other side was the human rights constitutional issues. Uh, which were being uh, put forward by the opposition and the civic movement, which ZANU-PF then uh, constructed as a Western intervention, as an outside discourse. Unfortunately, what we, what we know is, of course, these two are not dichotomized, they are linked. The big, the big tragedy is the way in which ZANU-PF tried to uh, create a bifurcated wall uh, between the two narratives and the two types of politics which we are talking about. And so what we've seen here is a redistribution program which has very quickly slided into a narrow elite accumulation, as Shone has, 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 has uh, uh, explained, uh, deeply embedded in corruption, and a state elite which is increasingly relying on holding on to its accumulation through repression, rather through to any forms of broader consent. On the other hand, a tie to this deepening uh, reconfiguration of the crisis is a, a, a massive loss of human rights and uh, fragility of livelihoods. Uh, so that the increase we've seen in human rights abuses has been um, uh, therefore run parallel to what was supposed to be a radical redistribution program, which has turned into an elite capture uh, around whether it's land, mineral resources, uh, government tenders, 
uh, that the Zimbabwe uh, liberation legacy, I would say, is now increasingly in tatters in terms of how it's being uh, uh, put forward now by the current regime. So I think uh, also on a broader level, we have the manner in which this is being addressed or not addressed in the region. What we've seen from both SADC and the African Union to date is a continued solidarity with a highly repressive and authoritarian regime in the name of a certain liberation solidarity. Not solidarity with the rights of the citizens of Zimbabwe, but solidarity with the thieving and increasing repression of a state which has uh, increasing disregard for the livelihoods of Zimbabwean citizens. And this solidarity, I think, is casting a huge shadow over the moral and political legitimacy of SADC and countries in the region. At times when they should be speaking to certain values of what we thought were values of the liberation movement, which included basic human rights. After all, that was the first, first cause of nationalists in the 50s and the 60s in Zimbabwe. One person, one vote, human rights, equality. And the way these have been completely disregarded by the state and ignored by the region is quite disgraceful. And I think therefore it casts a shadow over the future of such organizations like SADC if they are not able to live up to these massive demands for basic human and uh, living rights of Zimbabweans who now live increasingly precarious uh, uh, forms of livelihood. I think therefore we see when we hear the government talking about sanctions as causing these problems, we have to, of course, have a much more nuanced position on what sanctions have done uh, to the, with the Zimbabwean economy and the difference between the United States sanctions and the EU sanctions. They're not the same thing. And unfortunately, we're not getting a more informed debate on that because the ANU-PF is constructing it as one thing, as the only uh, um, uh, cause of the crisis in Zimbabwe and completely denying its own uh, uh, responsibility for the massive abuses that have taken place. And as I said, the, the regional position at the moment is extremely disappointing. So the, the tragedy here is that increasingly, uh, we, we um, Zimbabweans for, for decades have been told about the liberation struggle and many of us, many Zimbabweans still have deep respect for the legacies of the liberation movement. But we also now are getting a, a less romanticized view of those legacies and their implications for Zimbabwe, for the post-colonial politics, not just in Zimbabwe, but in the region as a whole. And it's time to ask questions of all liberation movements. Is this what you fought for? Is this the kind of dignity or lack of dignity that you want your citizens to face? If not, then do something about it. Speak out speak out about the gross abuses that this uh, militarized regime in Zimbabwe is carrying out. Speak out about the precarity of lives of ordinary Zimbabwean citizens, families who can barely survive, activists who are being abused on a daily basis, women being abused and raped, the uh, uh, basic rights of prisoners being uh, disregarded, uh, the rights of, 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 of lawyers to represent their, their, their uh, uh, defendants in the case of, for example, Beatrice Mtetwa and Hopewell Chinono. These are, these are basic issues which people had thought would become central to what a democratic state is. And so again, it's time to unpackage what was supposedly a radical rhetoric of redistribution and expose it for what it is, a real militarist capture and thieving of public resources and a massive, massive um, uh, abuse of the rights of citizens who once put such faith in the legacies of liberation struggle. Let me stop there. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, um, Prof. 
um, for such a brilliant presentation. I think uh, you are tracing it back to the values and the ideals of the liberation struggle, uh, that the liberation struggle was not just meant to deal with the economic questions, but it was also about human rights, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of association, and freedom of expression. But those values are being negated, possibly not just in Zimbabwe, but also by other liberation movements uh, in the region. And uh, I think that uh, to our viewers, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the comments uh, section. And uh, we'll start uh, taking uh, questions now. And questions from the, from the viewers. Um, Dr. Twende Pishoni, whilst we are waiting uh, for the questions from the viewers, or oh, they've just come in. Yeah, there's a comment there from Mr. K. The problem in Zimbabwe is that there was a coup by a faction of the ZANU-PF that wants to give in to neoliberalism and compliance with the IMF and the World Bank. On the recent global compensation deed, I think our viewer there is talking about uh, the Zimbabwe government that has promised to pay the former white commercial farmers 3.5 billion US dollars as compensation. Uh, Twende, would you like to respond to that? Thank you, um, and uh, thanks, uh, Mr. K, for, for that very important question. Of course, I think the, the post uh, the November 2017 coup, the Second Republic has sought to reintegrate the country um, in, into the global village, and uh, therefore they have um, ceased to follow the redistributive uh, pol policies and you have now adopted the neoliberal approach. Uh, and in the process, they've sought to appease the um, uh, global institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank. And that explains why they have um, agreed to pay the uh, former white commercial farmers. In, 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 I think the challenge that we see there is that uh, the payment of the white commercial farmers leaves out the workers, for instance, that were working for these farmers. Because at the, at the time of uh, Jambanja, which is the first land reform, the promise was that these workers will be paid when the farmers get uh, repaid but she, or get paid for or compensated for the land. But now in this agreement, you see that it concentrates on the 4,500 white commercial farmers and leaves out more than 300,000 farm workers that were left uh, unpaid and stranded uh, in the farm compounds. It, it, com it confirms with what we have said that there is a narrow focus that leaves out the majority of the citizens outside the accumulation uh, uh, processes and, li and, and leaves a, a livelihood crisis uh, for the majority of the citizens. It is an unfortunate uh, policy for Zimbabwe. All right. Now, thank you, uh, Prof. What why is the Zimbabwean government at this juncture promising to pay $3.5 billion to the former white commercial farmers? What is the politics there? I think it's one uh, attempt to try and put forward a, a, a position that they are trying to re-engage. Um, I think it's a very weak position because it's being done in the context of a uh, complete lack of other reforms, both politically and economically. But the hope is that this uh, fixation on, on compensation of white farmers will perhaps bring the British back into a, a, a dialogue with the, with the Zimbabwe government and then bring traction to a new re-engagement. I doubt that will happen. 
I think there's too many other things going wrong in the country. It's certainly not going to, uh, I don't need to remove the EU, even though the EU has very limited restricted measures still on the government of Zimbabwe, and definitely not likely to move the US, which has its own, uh, its own preoccupations and problems. But where Zadera is, is a very difficult process to move, uh, because it has so many levels of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of Senate and, and uh, represent, House of Representatives issues that have to be dealt with. So I don't think that this is going to do very much to the intention to move the re-engagement process forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justina, there has been lots of comments uh, in the chat box uh, with some viewers saying that uh, the abductions that you are talking about are fake. What's your comment on that? Um, I think that's a new narrative that has been adopted to say that um, abductions are, are fake. Um, I would not want to believe that anyone would be in a position to abduct themselves and to brutally uh, torture themselves and sexually assault themselves. Um, I saw a comment there where someone is saying that the crutches have disappeared and the bandages have disappeared. I think I would only listen if there was a medical doctor who looked, uh, because I think the reference there that was being made was being made on, on the three young uh, MDC um, leaders who were talking about having been arrested by the police, taken to Arari Central Police Station, and then um, abducted from there. What I also want to say is that when you look at what happened to Tawanda Mchehiwa, um, he was arrested by the police and was actually abducted from the police where he was then subjected uh, to um, brutal uh, torture. I think people have seen the images, they've seen the videos um, um, when he was in hospital. And for me, we are connecting the dots that these young women spoke about having been taken, uh, having been arrested, taken to a police station and then grabbed from there. And then we now have uh, this young man who was also arrested by the police and grabbed from the police. I really do not uh, believe that uh, anyone is in a position to abduct themselves. Um, let me also say I am a victim of state-sponsored abduction. And um, I actually know what actually um, goes on there. And this narrative really does not hold water in terms of denying that there have been abductions. Thank you. We're getting more questions there from the, from the viewers. Oh, there's a comment from Tanya that there's no distinction between army, state, and government. Probably that the crisis in Zimbabwe is a situation whereby you have a militarized uh, party state. Um, would anybody want to comment on that? I can take that one. Um, I think Tanya is right, basically speaking about the conflation uh, between party and state, it's very difficult uh, for us to make the distinction if what uh, the security forces are putting forward is actually a ZANU-PF agenda or a, 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 a government um, agenda or a state agenda. At the end of the day, it's one and the same thing, and it kind of makes everything very difficult. And I think earlier on you spoke about how people do not have confidence and trust in some of these institutions because um, of this situation of the conflation between um, party and um, 
and state. And at the end of the day, citizens cannot enjoy um, having those institutions that are supposed to be institutions of the state uh, protecting them because those institutions actually have a mandate in terms of protecting the rights of citizens. But when they are in the corner with um, the ruling party, it then becomes a problematic situation. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Justina. We, are st we still have about uh, 15 more minutes to take more questions. What role has the international community played in this crisis? Is there any hope out of this crisis? I think, uh, Brian, you can uh, respond to that, but also bring into perspective what, what has yeah. been happening recently, because we have read that uh, the South African government, President Ramaphosa, sent an envoy to Zimbabwe uh, to try and find ways of resolving the crisis. Uh, any hope? Thank you. Uh, look, I, I don't think the, uh, the international community is blameless. There have been, uh, been problems and challenges which in, uh, in the manner in which the international community or certain forces at the international level have engaged, and it's, it's differed over the years. In the 1980s, of course, there was a great deal of goodwill there was an attempt to support the uh, reconciliation process. Um, uh, the, by the late 1990s, with the increasing uh, growth of the opposition and the discourse around the, the land, there became increasing conflicts over issues of private property, redistribution, rule of law. Uh, what I think has uh, exacerbated and polarized the debate is the debate around uh, targeted measures and sanctions. And in this way, I think uh, Zanu PF has very skillfully, as I said, constructed this narrative as basically the major cause of the crisis in Zimbabwe, completely denying its own responsibility. The challenge now is how we get to some kind of consensus between national, regional, and international forces to, to bring people together to some kind of discussion. Historically, the two moments when this has happened, and there's been some progress, has been in 1979 with Lancaster House Agreement and in 2008 with the Global Political Agreement, where at national, regional, and international level, various pressures brought the internal parties together into a discussion on the way forward. At the moment, we are very far from that. We have a polarization at national level and a polarization between the region and the international forces about what to do about Zimbabwe and the role of the sanctions issue within that. I think a key player here, I think, can still be South Africa in trying to help to lead a process in SADC, which will allow to open up a debate towards a consensus. It's a difficult time. I think the current South African government does not have the international uh, kind of uh, diplomatic credibility that previous governments have had and is also mired in its own internal crisis around corruption and of course the epidemic. But I think as things stand, the South African government still has some sway in helping to lead a debate uh, and to then be able to engage not only with national forces, but with the international community. Outside of that movement, we have a state in Zimbabwe which clearly is going to hold on to power at any cost, at the cost of millions of lives if necessary. Uh, thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, let's get more questions. Have the economic emancipation would not materialize without political liberalization. It basically should start at a political space as economic activities are largely driven by an effective government. I think our viewer there is saying that uh, what you need to do is to resolve the political crisis first so that you'll be able to have a sustainable uh, economic uh, reconstruction. To end up a short call on that. Thanks uh, for that question. I, I think I think that uh, 
this has been a narrative that uh, has been pushed uh, to say that uh, there is a political uh, illegitimacy of uh, the current government and therefore the economy would not function. But if uh, the, the person who is asking the question listened to my presentation, I'm saying and arguing that the structural deficiencies in the accumulation model leads to a political crisis. And therefore, any resolution of the crisis in Zimbabwe must be inclusive, such that it rebuilds the trust between the citizens and, and the government. And any international solidarity that must come in must also ensure uh, that it is uh, neutral and inclusive in its approach. Uh, I, would, I would somehow, however, um, uh, agree to the manner in which, because the army seems to be sitting at the apex of the, the, the ruling class, uh, directing ZANU-PF, directing government, the judiciary and, and the parliament. And uh, we, which means basically Zimbabwe is um, a military state uh, that uh, is disguised uh, as a civilian leader is presented uh, uh, to, to, to be seen as the face of, of the military and often replaced uh, now and then when the interest. And to that extent, I, I would then agree that uh, there is an element of a political crisis at that level that must be dealt with. But the genesis of this is an economic crisis. All right, thank you. We have we still have more comments uh, from Constance. Sadak is like a dead bent wood. Convince me if I am wrong. Zan PF similar to ANC is doing as they please. Who holds these politicians accountable at Sadak? Yes, Brian, go ahead. Do you want me to come in? Sure. You, I mean, the, the, the comment is correct. SADC is a very weak institution. Its structures are, are very weak. And its movement on particular issues depends on particular countries taking the lead in taking things forward, as South Africa did in 2007-2008 in, uh, in the GPA period. At the moment, we certainly don't seem to have any states in the region who are yet willing to take that position. And unless there's pressure on these states from citizens to ask new questions of SADC, the, that regional body is going to become increasingly discredited. And it's, it's, it's a sad thing because um, uh, the AU, of course, will take no action because of the principle of subsidiarity, where they will only take action dependent on the, the measures uh, suggested by regional bodies like SADAC or ECOWAS or the East African uh, uh, organizations. So I think that um, uh, at the moment, we are really in a very difficult situation, just both nationally and within the region, where particular governments in the region are caught in their own uh, particular crisis, particularly in the period of the epidemic. Uh, Zimbabwe is uh, it's not peculiar in its crisis of uh, post-colonial states. It's, there are many issues in the Zimbabwe crisis which are characteristic of other post-colonial states, but it has its particularities. Its particularities which are uh, particularly disturbing in this context and where you would hope that regional bodies would begin to talk to those issues in order to address broader regional problems. We are simply not seeing that at the moment. Th th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to alert our viewers that uh, Justina Mukoko uh, had to leave. She's rushing for another meeting with uh, Kosatu. Uh, 
I think she, she has been very valuable, but we can continue for the last uh, four minutes. Can we get more, more questions? Uh, yeah, there's a question here from Frank Matose from the University of Cape Town. Given these three perspectives by the panelists, what would each of them suggest as the way forward? Not just for Zimbabwe, but for neighboring countries, for SADC and for the AU. I think uh, you have already tried to explain the role of SADC and the role of the African Union, but I think uh, you should focus on what should be the way forward. And perhaps uh, both of you um, can also address this question because some are asking why should South Africa be involved anyway? There are comments like that in the, co in the, in the section. What should be the way forward? Twende, can you start? Sure. Um... Thank you. I, I think the question to say, why should South Africa be involved um, and what is the way forward? I think for, 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 for South Africa, it is important that they uh, get involved. Um, in the first instance, there is uh, an element of sub-imperialism where uh, resources uh, from Zimbabwe and other countries actually find their way uh, whether legally or through illicit means uh, to South Africa. They, they, there is, for instance, in the tobacco sector, a lot of smuggling of tobacco that comes here and is seen being traded in the illegal markets. These are resources that should be or are supposed to be used in those countries, but they are uh, taken to uh, South Africa and other Western countries uh, where they find their ways uh, and do not give the uh, appropriate value back to Zimbabwe. So part of the problem that we see in Zimbabwe is the export of mat raw material, including agricultural goods or commodities uh, at cheap values, um, which leads to the exportation or, uh, of these goods to this country at cheap value. And, and as a result, we see that the people who are supposed to be employed in the Zimbabwean economy end up being uh, having to follow their resources to wherever they are. And uh, it's, it's a challenge that we see now in SADC and many countries. So there is need for uh, South Africa uh, and other countries to be involved. But we, we see that because of the sisterhood between ANC and ZANPF, there is a perception that she, the mediation is always uh, unfair. So perhaps an inter-party uh, uh, process from South Africa uh, could do help uh, where maybe the parliament in South Africa through the committee, International Relations Committee could actually be sent to on a fact-finding mission to establish the truth and to design a, a solution that is more sustainable. Uh, and that uh, perhaps we could have uh, uh, former heads of state like uh, Ian Kama to lead those processes because they 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 are exemplary in 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 Africa uh, and, and as has been seen in the past. Thank you, Tendepi. Uh, we we're running out of time. Perhaps uh, Brian, can you just give us your parting shot as well on the way forward? Maybe in just a minute. Yeah, I think, sure. I think, look, this is not something that will be answered quickly. I think, but, but I think one of the ingredients is that the opposition internally has to put their house in order as well. There has to be much better strategizing, a much better creation of a consensus internally so that the message that's coming from within Zimbabwe in terms of the demands that are being made are much clearer and much more articulate in addition to the issues that John DP has stressed. Thank you. Thank you, viewers. Thank you, our panelists. I think it was a very informative um, debate. Definitely the crisis is multifaceted, economic, political, humanitarian um, crisis there. And uh, hopefully there's going to be 
a solution soon so that Zimbabwe can go back to fulfill the ideals and values of the liberation struggle, which also included the respect for human rights and the economic emancipation for its indigenous people. We meet again next week, Thursday, when we continue uh, to discuss topical issues on the continent. Uh, remember to stay safe. COVID-19 is still with us. Goodbye, viewers. Thank you. Till next time.